Hello there, it's, it's Abdullah here, and I'm going to explain to you two um, uh, cases in general surgery that are um, related to, it could be uh, final year medical students, um, and it could be also helpful in uh, uh, MRCS exam, and it could be helpful in uh, PLAP uh, part B. It's basically a generic examination that I've just done today for the medical students, and I would like to share with you. Um, so basically, we have case number one. It's a, it's a 68 year old female patient, and this is a real case that uh, has been seen today in the hospital. Um, a female patient came to an E with abdominal pain. Uh, your task as a let's say as a candidate to, to take history and do abdominal examination. So in terms of the abdominal history, you, we're talking about abdominal pain first. Um, so in terms of um, the abdominal pain. Um, so initially, you need to take uh, the history of pain itself. Um, so you need to assess for where is this pain and the, the onset of this pain uh, and the, the character of this pain and also the um, uh, is it radiating anywhere and um, um, are there any associated symptoms with that? And I, I will answer every question separately now. Any associated symptoms, anything that can increase it and anything that decreases it. So this pain has um, uh, uh, basically a uh, right uh, lower quadrant abdominal pain um, and uh, left lower quadrant abdominal pain. So it's basically in both sides, but it's more prominent in uh, the left side. Uh, this pain has been intermittent onset. Uh, onset. So uh, the pain... Um, has been there for one week and has increased significantly for the last two days. Uh, so the patient came to a &E because of that. It is a dull aching uh, pain and it does not radiate anywhere. It's associated with um, feeling of nausea, but there is no vomiting at all. And number three, and also associated with um, uh, uh, bit of uh, distension, abdominal distension and um, and not passing flatus and uh, absolutely uh, constipated and absolutely constipated as well. Uh, well, um, anything that increases that movement uh, does increase the pain and um, uh, coughing uh, does increase the pain as well. Uh, it does respond to painkillers, uh, but um, not significantly. All right. So um, um, these are the pain characters. What else you need to um, um, ask for while you are um, examining this patient? At this stage, after assessing the pain, you should have formulated um, a bit of um, differential diagnosis in your mind. So this patient is presented by uh, abdominal pain, and um, nausea, which is, I understand she doesn't have vomiting, but still she's nauseous. And abdominal distension, no pass inflators, and constipated. So I would say, I, do, I would think of intestinal obstruction for whatever the reason is. So I will start asking my patient more questions about intestinal obstruction, differential diagnosis. So. I will go for number one, the mechanical obstruction. So we would ask the patient about her constipation. How long have you been constipated? And then ask her about the bowel habits um, and if there is any change recently in her bowel habits as well. Um, so number two is adhesions. You can appropriately ask her in this stage about any previous uh, surgery uh, or, or any previous radiotherapy, for example. Um, again, uh, what are the other differential diagnoses? I would think of the vulvulus as well. The vulvulus is one of the differential diagnoses. Specifically, this patient has intermittent long history of abdominal pain. So ask her if she had similar episodes of this of this condition before. And when you ask her that, she says, yeah, I had this six years ago and um, they have inserted a tube in my back passage, inserted a tube in my back passage to decompress my uh, abdomen, all right? So that, I mean, it tells you the diagnosis without even thinking or reaching anything. So um, you would ask her about her diet as well as a risk factor of here, you will ask her about anything that increases intra-abdominal pressure 
and this include any past medical history like COPD. When you magically ask her about that, this patient does have COPD uh, or um, chronic cough, basically. And then um, when you ask her about as well, carnist patient again, you can ask here, and also the fiber diet. She, she does eat high fiber diet, which is a risk factors. Carrying heavy objects as well. Our patient does not carry heavy objects, but you will need to ask um, this question. Um, um, what else in our differential diagnosis? I would think of cancer. Ask her about any recent weight loss. Or, um, all right. Um, this is for cancer. I would think of hernia and incarcerate the hernia as well. Ask her if she had any masses in her tummy or any previous surgery. Or you can ask about the risk factors of hernia, which is basically the same as risk, these risk factors. What are other differentials that you can uh, think of uh, in, in, in this patient? So um, mesenteric ischemia is also one of the uh, uh, problems that can come in this patient. Uh, so mesenteric ischemia, ask about the AF. Do you have any cardiac issue or any problem with your heart? Are you in any blood thinning medication as well? That can tell you if the patient is AF or any uh, of those conditions, all right? Um, so um, you can also think of diverticulitis. Um, uh, and um, you can ask if uh, the pain is localized to the left uh, quadrant. And again, the risk factors that we mentioned, which is conispation, which our patient does have conispation, they eat high fiber diet and carry heavy objects. And these are risk factors of diverticulitis. All right. So after establishing um, here, you, you pretty much established a good differential diagnosis and asked all the questions. And in this particular patient, let me summarize to you, she's 62, female patient, presented with intermittent abdominal pain, had previously decompression of her bowel with a tube that she does not remember what, what was her diagnosis. And also, um, uh, 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 she has COPD and she has chronic constipation. So it could be anything really. It could be valvulus. This is the first of my differential diagnosis. It could be diverticulitis. It could be hernia as well, or incarcerated hernia. But my patient denied the masses that slightly exclude the hernia, but still it will remain as one of my differential diagnosis. If we go through this, so the presenting complaints is two to seven days, uh, I mean, two days, uh, history of abdominal pain, prolonged history of intermittent abdominal pain, presented today with nausea, vomiting, severe abdominal pain, and also long history of constipation. She has two episodes of vulvulus before, and we added to that the COPD, which the patient mentioned after I wrote this case. Social history, she lives with husband, and also uh, she's fit and well. She doesn't have any medical condition, mobilized independently. She is a smoker. This is why she has COPD and she drinks occasionally. Family history, nil of concern. You ask her about ideas, concerns, and expectation. Our patient had two concerns. And these concerns was what caused it, number one. And number two, um, uh, 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 is it likely to come back? Is it recurrent or not? And do we need to answer the patient's concerns at the end of the consultation, all right? So um, after doing all of this, you go and examine your patient and I will tell you my examination findings now. So your examination was the abdomen is soft, non-tender. There is no masses in the abdomen. All right, let's, let's make it a little bit more organized. So in your inspection, the patient is not distressed does not have any sign of pain. She's very comfortable lying in bed, but the bed is 45 degrees, 45 degrees. And when you ask her to, bed, to put the bed flat, she tells you, no, it does increase my pain when I lie flat, all right? Uh, this is in your inspection. She doesn't have any scars in the abdomen. She doesn't have any mass in the abdomen. She doesn't have no obvious pulsations in the abdomen as well.
all right? When you do your palpation, the abdomen is soft and non-tender, generally soft and non-tender. There is no point of tenderness at all. There is no point of tenderness at all. And now she has been in hospital for two days and she tells you that I had the tube uh, inserted again. And you don't really understand why this tube, she tells you through my back passage, all right? And then, uh, so the abdomen is soft and tender and there is no point of tenderness and there is no organomegaly. You examine the spleen, you examine the liver, you examine the, um, uh, uh, for ascites as well, no organomegaly, and there is no ascites as well, all right? So this is a your palpation. So I would say the examination is a little bit um, uh, unremarkable in this patient, but she already had treatment, as she mentioned. She does not have the tube at the moment. The tube was taken out yesterday morning, and um, uh, she tells you that I'm feeling absolutely fine, all right? So this is in your examination. So when you have a scenario like that, you don't know the diagnosis yet, right? So the question will be, what is uh, your differential diagnosis? So again, like I mentioned earlier, when you have a question like that in your exam and the patient already had treatment and you don't know the differential diagnosis, you just say what you think. So differential diagnosis, like I said, you need to present it in a certain way. You need to be speaking very confidently about your findings and their significance in establishing your differential diagnosis. So I would say, so I have a relatively old patient. She's 62, female patient, uh, presented with intermittent abdominal pain that has been there for around one week. It has increased for the last two days and she's constipated she's distended and she's nauseous and has vomiting and also has um, a, 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 a constipation as well. So we say constipation, distension, nausea, um, vomiting and complete absence of latus, right? So I would say like that, 62 female intermittent abdominal pain, one week history and two days of pain, constipation, distension, nausea, vomiting. These are signs of the intestinal obstruction. I would rule out the main differential diagnosis of intestinal obstruction. On the top of my list in this patient is a vulvus, all right? And um, the reason why uh, she's constipated and she has uh, one of the risk factors, which is COPD, and she also has um, um, a, a previous history of Vulvulus, all right? However, uh, I would exclude other diagnoses like hernia, and I have excluded that by the um, uh, 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 abdominal examination. I couldn't see any mass, but also exclude the mechanical obstructions, and this will need further investigations. I would like to exclude cancer, and this will need further investigation that I would like to do, and I would like to exclude as well the adhesions, despite this patient's at low risk since she had never had before uh, any radiotherapy or any uh, surgery in her abdomen, okay? Well, um, the next question will be, what investigations will you do for this patient? So initially, uh, I will do um, uh, the... Uh, so any investigations, when you when you encounter with this question, uh, you need to say, I will do some bloods and I will do some bedside investigations and I will do um, uh, some, uh, 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 so basically the labs, like we said, and the bedside investigation, and I will do some imaging, all right? So uh, the, the key bedside investigation here, you can do an ECG, you can do a urine uh, dip to rule out any UTI, which is good. Which could be one of the differentials as well. And um, the, these are bedside and also blood glucose very quickly. Uh, these are basic investigations. Bloods, I will do an FPC to check on the hemoglobin level and the white blood cells, uh, which is very helpful in diagnosing diverticular disease or uh, cholecystitis, for example. I will do U and E, and this is a crucial part um, to rule out the hypokalemia, which is expected in patients with ischemic changes in the bowel due to uh, acidosis, all right? And I will also do um, um, 
uh, uh, CRP as well, which is helpful in ruling out diagnosis that are infection related. And I will also do uh, um, a liver function test, which is helpful in cholecystitis and uh, jaundice diagnosis, despite my patient does not have any jaundice, but I will still do it. And I will also do group and screen, preparing the patient for uh, potential surgery. And I will do a COVID strap as well, preparing her for potential surgery. And I will do a coagulation profile. And finally, I will do an APG if the patient is very unwell to rule out acidosis. And it's really helpful to give me an idea about the electrolytes as well. All right. Uh, so these are the bloods that I will do for my patient. Imaging, and here is the key for diagnosis, abdominal x-ray um, uh, that is erect. Uh, uh, or standing abdominal x-ray, uh, basically to look for a few things. Number one, impaction of a stool. Number two, air under diaphragm, and this uh, rules out the perforation uh, of the bowel. I will also do, um, um, I mean, the x-ray will also help us in diagnosing the vulvulus or diagnosing uh, the uh, intestinal obstruction. And this is by present of air uh, fluid, uh, level basically. So um, imaging, I would consider if the x-ray is not helpful, I would also consider CT abdomen and pelvis with uh, contrast, all right, uh, to rule out any uh, uh, occult uh, presentation in the abdomen. When you do the x-ray, uh, unfortunately I don't have the x-ray now, but you found the typical coffee bean sign exactly like that with loss of frustration in the abdomen. This is very smooth and it's exactly coffee bean sign. And you can, you can see on this side, loads of fecal impaction all the way. So this is uh, a diagnosis of um, uh, sigmoid vulvulus. You wait it until it's reported and it tells you it's sigmoid vulvulus. You were not happy by this X-ray and you've done a CT abdomen and pelvis with contrast, it is reported as sigmoid vulvulus. What to do next? How do you manage sigmoid vulvulus? So again, the management is basically a few things. Number one, temporary management. Number two, initial management, or actually number one, initial management, temporary management, and definitive management. So the initial management include, number one, resuscitation of this patient. So you will do the A, B, C, D, E approach, and you will insert a cannula for this patient. You will assess the volemic status of the patient. You will start fluid if needed um, for this patient, and you will do all the bloods that we talked about early, and um, you will give the patient proper analgesia, and you will arrange for the scans as well. Number two, temporary. So you now you know that it is sigmoid vulvulus. So what you need to do here is to decompress the power. And this can happen by sigmoidoscopy, sigmoidoscopy uh, plus minus tube insertion, plus minus tube insertion. So basically, we'll pass the, the rigid sigmoidoscope and the tube through it that goes into the tummy to decompress the bowel, evacuate some of the stools, evacuate some of the air inside, and the patient, boom, suddenly relieved, okay? Uh, definitive management, definitive management. Uh, sometimes, if this is recurrent condition, you need to fix one side of the bowel to the abdominal wall, and this is basically you do laparotomy, okay? Laparotomy, all right. So these are basically sigmoid vulvas, one of the interesting cases that I've seen today uh, and I just wanted to share with you. Thank you very much.